I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of the MSA Coalition's Conference for Patients and Caregivers. I'm also so fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to start our MSA clinic here with co-founder Dr. Laura Ree in palliative medicine and Tricia Stevens, our nurse in autonomic disorders. We started the clinic in about 2018 and it partnered with a number of other specialists, which we will talk about today. And we'll also talk about their role in caring for patients with MSA. Then after our individual talks, we'll have a forum and we'll look forward to answering questions from all of you, which we'll work to answer to the best of our ability. I have no disclosures. And these are the learning objectives from today to describe multidisciplinary care for MSA and to introduce the role of different team members. So first, to describe multidisciplinary care in MSA, let's first talk about uh, some of the complex symptoms that we can see in MSA. So just as the name suggests, multiple system atrophy involves multiple systems. And we've heard earlier in this conference about how all of these systems can be involved. And, and also, in addition to all of these uh, symptoms, like the motor symptoms of Parkinson's and ataxia, tremor dystonia, treatment for them can affect other symptoms. So we know there can be cognitive problems in addition to the motor problems, mood issues, speech and swallowing, constipation affecting the GI system, cold extremities and feet, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, acting out those dreams and restless leg symptoms, as well as the autonomic dysfunction with orthostatic hypotension that we heard about from Dr. Schumann and the thermoregulation or lack of sweating issues. We also know that the bladder can be affected. It can be quite problematic as well as sexual dysfunction, which can be an early symptom and present throughout the course of the disease. But in addition to all of these symptoms, treating one or part of them can lead to worsening of another system or symptoms. So for instance, treating Parkinsonism with levodopa often leads to worsening of orthostatic hypotension. So to treat that, we increase fluids, increase salt, but then this leads to worsening of the bladder issues and the incontinence, and perhaps even the bowel issues. And we now know patients are trying to get to the bathroom more frequently, and this can lead to increased risk for falls and all the sequelae that can come from that. So in thinking about all of these systems and symptoms, it's important to keep in mind that this is all occurring within one individual patient. Also, all of these different symptoms can lead to different specialists being involved in care. So for instance, from a motor standpoint, we know that physiatry uh, and a movement disorder specialists are frequently involved, PT and OT. From a cognitive standpoint, that may mean that a, a cognitive specialist, behavioral neurologist is involved. A psychiatrist might be involved if the mood symptoms are really problematic. And speech and language pathology can be really helpful for the speech and swallowing problems. Striders typically cared for by an ENT specialist and sleep specialist for all the sleep disorders that can come in MSA. From the low blood pressure standpoint, sometimes a cardiologist is involved. Other times it's an autonomic specialist or an autonomic neurologist. That's also who's involved for some of these sweating disorders, though sometimes it could be a dermatologist. And a urologist is frequently necessary for some of the bladder symptoms. A gastroenterologist may be helpful for constipation. And from the sexual standpoint, sometimes urologists or sometimes internists are all playing a role. And sometimes internists is really helping with all, a number of these different symptoms. But when we have all of these specialists, it can be difficult for everyone to be on the same page and talking to each other. And are we really addressing the whole picture and thinking about the future or just divvying up different problems to tackle? So this is where coordinated care and particularly involving specialists who focus on quality of life issues, such as a palliative medicine specialist can be helpful. So if we try and think about uh, all of these symptoms coming together in a patient with MSA and all of these different features from the motor to the autonomic to the speech and the sleep and the mood, 
and try and think about what if we align our care team with that individual patient? This is what that could look like involving a neurologist who specializes in MSA, a palliative specialist, nursing really at the center, physical medicine and rehabilitation, speech pathology, nutrition, caregiver support, and that sleep specialist in addition to other providers that may be needed at different times. And there are uh, other models of care in neurodegenerative diseases. So for instance, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS uh, has the ALS association, which certifies different centers. There are a couple different levels of certification. So there's a recognized center, there's a certified center, and this typically involves multidisciplinary care. So the providers involved in the ALS centers typically include a neurologist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, respiratory therapist, nursing, dietitian, speech language pathologist, social worker, mental health professional, and the ALS association is involved. There can often be a kind of a caregiver type support as part of that, as well as a support groups that patients can or cannot participate in depending on their interests. There are currently 186 of these centers in the United States. And what's interesting to know too, is that this specialized care for ALS has been shown in a number of different studies to improve care. Specifically, survival is longer in some patients who have uh, tertiary care uh, for ALS. And it's considered to be due to better implementation of supportive treatments for this disorder. But also patients within these tertiary care centers for ALS tend to have reduced hospitalization rates, which is a good thing for patients and caregivers, but it's also cost of effective to patients in the community. What about another neurologic disorder or Huntington's disease? So this is a neurodegenerative disorder that has a very strong genetic component. There are Huntington's disease uh, centers of excellence, which are certified through the Huntington's Disease Society of America. This care team tends to involve neurologists, psychiatrists, social workers, therapists, counselors, and others with experience working with families affected by Huntington's disease. Currently, there are 54 centers in 35 states. And from my experience in uh, spending some time in a Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence is that there's often a research component associated with this as well. Now, I've learned a lot about uh, caring for MSA in a coordinated way through talking with some colleagues at the UT Southwestern. Specifically, Steve Bernino has a, 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 his works has centered this MSA clinic there through UT Southwestern. It was founded in 2015, and there are multiple subspecialists who are involved in their model of M MSA clinic. This is a benefactor-funded uh, uh, clinic, as some of these uh, models of care can be expensive um, to provide. In terms of multidisciplinary care for MSA, I think it has a significant uh, benefits. So in treating the whole patient in integrating the caregiver needs and facilitating this communication between different team members, especially those who have specific interest in MSA and, and really interest in caring for patients and caregivers with MSA. Now, there can be some downside as well. In particular, it can be time intensive for both patients and caregivers as well as providers. I wanna dwell on that a bit because if we think about all of these different specialists being involved, of course it would be ideal if everyone was weighing in at every clinic visit. But the problem with that is it can take a significant amount of time. It can be exhausting for anyone to go through that many visits and especially for patients and caregivers with MSA. So I think what's really important is having individualized tailored tailored care to get the right specialist to the patient at the right time in the course of the disease. That, of course, can be difficult to manage and it can be very, uh, uh, take a lot of time, very time intensive as well. And I'm also hearing from the administrators that there is a, a high cost associated with delivering this type of care as well. So the next section of this talk is going to be to introduce the roles of different team members. 
So first, let's start with the neurologist, because that's easy, because that's me. And so as a neurologist uh, in MSA clinic, I am often focusing on the motor problems, the Parkinsonism, the ataxia. Would levodopa or changing the levodopa be helpful for an individual patient? I'm also screening for cognitive problems and listening to caregivers if they've had any concerns. And that may be doing some bedtime testing, and if necessary, referring for more uh, complex or uh, neuropsychometric testing. From the autonomic standpoint, we're certainly screening for orthostatic hypotension, as well as that supine hypertension. So when you're lying flat, that blood pressure being too high, and how the different medications are interacting with other parts of the body. I think it's important to talk to patients about the lack of sweating and how this could predispose them to heat stroke or potentially worsen some of their other problems. And I also try and assess the swallowing function by listening to the patients and, and trying to witness a swallow and, and also giving recommendations for constipation. Though I will say I've learned a lot and, and, and I feel that my palliative medicine specialists are really uh, much better at uh, giving tailored recommendations. Um, bladder, we often assess whether medication or non-medications can be helpful and when a urologist is really going to be needed, like if catheterization is necessary. We talk about sexual function as well. That's of interest to the patient and, and how this could be integrated in their care. I'm also thinking about triggers, triggers for when other specialists need to be involved, like we talked about that incontinence and catheterization and when sleep medicine specialists who were earlier in this uh, conference uh, really need to be involved, like with Strider, for instance. So now I'm so grateful to be able to work with uh, Dr. Mutvik, who is a physical medicine and rehabilitation uh, provider. So the goal for physical medicine and rehabilitation or physiatry is to enhance and restore functional ability and quality of life to people with physical impairments or disabilities. Some of the triggers for referral include a change in mobility, falls, or worsening of falls, or gate aid assessment and recommendations. And often uh, this is kind of our link to physical therapy and occupational therapy, uh, although patients often have this um, through their home institutions as well. In terms of speech pathology, speech pathologists diagnose and treat communication disorders, including difficulties with speaking such as dysarthria. And some of the triggers for referral include um, just understanding that and getting the right diagnosis uh, first, but also throughout the course of the disease, if there's a change in understandability or communication difficulties, they can give treatment recommendations and at different points recommend communication aid so that that communication is still possible even if patients have significant difficulty with speaking. As for uh, dysphagia and nutrition, so I'm grateful to work with our speech and language pathologists like Kathy Shonley and our nutritionists like Adele Pattinson, who are experts in swallowing mechanisms that can address and, and assess the function of swallowing, as well as give recommendations to optimize swallowing function. Nutrition can also be helpful in a variety of ways, and they're experts in feeding tubes and nutrition through feeding tubes or without feeding tubes. They can really be invaluable when we're talking about whether a feeding tube is a good option or something the patient may be interested in. And some of those triggers for referral include problems with swallowing, weight loss, or weight gain, making mobility more difficult to get those recommendations for dysphagia, nutrition, and possibly feeding tube. Now for palliative medicine, I'm so thankful to work with Drs. Ree and Chow. And when I introduce my palliative medicine colleagues, I say they are a specialized team that focuses on quality of life for people who have serious or chronic medical conditions. They meet uh, with patients and really provide an extra layer of support uh, as they are receiving their care from other doctors. Palliative care is really a supportive system. And what we found is that can be helpful from time of diagnosis really throughout the disease course and including end of life care such as hospice. Again, focusing on this complex symptom control, caregiver well being, spiritual concerns, and, and, and the end of life care. Social work, chaplaincy, and 
patient caregiver support are, are really so crucial in this disease. And that's where uh, our social workers and chaplaincy are providers that can help in a number of different circumstances. Our connections to these providers in, in our clinic, at least, has come through palliative medicine. And we're really grateful for the care that they provide for patients and their families and caregivers. And as for nursing and education, in our setup, our autonomic nurses, including Tricia Stevens, are really the hub of the wheel and provide so much initial information regarding the patient, help guide us with different issues and help with problem solving throughout uh, the, the clinic itself. And then even after are really instrumental in providing additional education for patients. As doctors, we know that patients and caregivers really can't absorb all of the information that's given during an individual uh, clinic visit. And that's where we've uh, focused more on having uh, Trisha do education then about a week later, just to see you know, what other questions still arrive, uh, what other education or information may be helpful in this disease process. So to summarize, the multiple symptoms and systems involved in multiple system atrophy really require a team approach to care. Centers of excellence are important in other neurodegenerative disorders, and I hope made the case that they can be really helpful for MSA as well. This coordinated care can really be beneficial for both patients, caregivers, and health providers uh, throughout the, the disease journey too. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to talking with you further during our question and answer portion of this session. Hi, I'm Dr. Modvik. I'm going to talk to you today about rehabilitation professionals and how they can be a very helpful part of your MSA care team. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest, a few objectives that you can read on your own. I'll be talking today about physical and occupational therapy, as well as physiatrists like me, and I will not be talking as much about speech and language pathologists. You will hear about uh, that line of work from some other presenters today. Physical therapist is going to be the person who teaches exercise, and mostly exercise for large muscle groups, shoulders, core, trunk, abdomen, legs, the muscles that help with mobility and balance and posture. A physical therapist is going to be instrumental in picking the best gait aid to reduce your risk of falls. And a physical therapist can be helpful for uh, treatment of musculoskeletal pain as well. Of course, there are many health benefits to exercise for all of us in general. Uh, regular exercise reduces risk of stroke and heart attack, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, and even helps uh, diminish depression. So all of us should be exercising uh, regularly, right? And there's a lot of published information about the benefits of Parkinson's disease and exercise with exercise, especially the aerobic exercise showing to um, uh, maintain ability to walk, the pace of walking, reduce fall risk, and even slows the disease progress. So Parkinson's disease, takes advantage of neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to develop new synapses and reorganize when it is exposed to gentle, regular stress, which is what exercise does. And there are many different ways to exercise well-developed in the Parkinson's community, um, body weight supported treadmill, regular treadmill, uh, some specific group types of exercises and even pool therapy. But is there evidence that exercise is helpful for MSA? I have to honestly say not as much evidence. Uh, MSA is not studied nearly as much, uh, probably because it is a, a less common condition. It is harder to find people to participate in studies. And maybe also because the uh, uh, disease changes a little bit more quickly in MSA than it does Parkinson's disease. So it's a little difficult to see what the effect of exercise is. But for as much as we can tell, because these are very similar disease processes, um, the exercise that works in Parkinson's disease should definitely work for individuals who have MSA, the Parkinson's type. And uh, a small study did in fact show that uh, over a short period of time, 
uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, patients with MSA Parkinson's type could get the same benefit from exercise over a six week period. Um, we know far less about exercise for the cerebellar type, unfortunately. And um, uh, there's still a lot to learn in this regard, but it still makes a lot of sense to exercise as when you can to maintain cardiopulmonary fitness, general strength uh, and balance as best as possible. So um, what options are there for therapy and exercise? Well, you can go for one-on-one -on -one training with physical or occupational therapist, but there are a lot of group classes, especially in the Parkinson's disease world, you should be able to participate in and enjoy as long as you can kind of keep up with the group and it doesn't feel like it's too out of hand or uh, pose any uh, fall risk for you. Um, other exercises such as Tai Chi or specialized yoga, like chair yoga um, uh, can work very well. But of course there are a number of barriers to exercise, aren't there? Um, it is hard to be motivated to exercise. It's hard to, to have the initiative uh, to exercise. Uh, fatigue is a strong um, problem. Um, it's difficult to participate. It might make you feel unsafe. Um, it might be frustrating to try to exercise, but other things get in the way. Some of the programs cost some money, some participation in some of the fitness centers and memberships uh, can have some fees associated with them. There might be difficulty with accessing um, or getting transportation to or from. There may be too few people in your neighborhood and your community that know how to do this very well. Your caregiver might be sort of overwhelmed with a lot of the other activities needed inside the home and just find it difficult to also get due to an exercise program. Um, and then we know that uh, medical care providers uh, do not often enough bring up exercise and therapy as part of the treatment regimen. So you should be prepared to ask for some of that yourself to try to get some um, help and opinions in that regard. Keep in mind that um, there are um, community type programs for you to hopefully uh, turn your attention to and for. Um, after getting done with physical or occupational therapy formally, there are many medical communities that have fitness organizations and fitness facilities attached with them. You can transition to that more independent type program um, often there is a mid-level uh, therapy support, such as an athletic trainer available. There are also physical therapy programs that now are embedded into fitness facilities and health clubs. And that can be very helpful for some of those trained individuals to help you with your individual exercise regimen. Um, there are organizations like the YMCA that from its inception has been um, committed to helping people with disabilities with their um, uh, fitness routines. And you might even think about starting your own program, whether you can get a hold of a therapist or a trainer who has a specific interest or is curious about this uh, condition, uh, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one training on your own or maybe a few um, uh, other individuals in your community that might have similar medical problems, um, try to find something that uh, you can get to work for you. I would also mention recreation is extremely important. And, um, and continuing to do the things that you've always done for recreation and personal fulfillment and enjoyment. Um, but you do have to be prepared for uh, adapting to a body that doesn't work quite the same. Um, there are many adaptive uh, organizations, adaptive hunting, adaptive golfing, adaptive gardening, adaptive artwork. There are people out there who can um, uh, help you with this, lots of internet sites. Um, and individuals in these organizations, organizations that really, really want um, um, their fellow um, uh, participants to keep participating and enjoying these things, even if their bodies are um, working differently. So that would be an example of uh, adaptive gardening, U.S. Adaptive Golf Alliance, again, an uh, organization committed to keeping people on the golf course, even though they might need some different adaptive equipment. So do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Keep trying to find ways to maintain your fitness and your um, involvement in the things that bring you joy. Um, Stephen Hawking did not have MSA. He had ALS, but is a great example of a person who um, uh, achieved a lot, even with a profound physical disability. Talking for a couple of minutes about DME, durable medical equipment, uh, there might be different things needed at different times of the disease course, starting initially with um, minimally restrictive things such as canes and sometimes moving to things that are much more supportive and large and somewhat bulky 
um, the lift equipment. So we can talk a little bit about those. Even canes have different shapes and weights to them. Uh, hiking poles can be helpful. Um, Two-wheeled walkers, four-wheeled walkers, each helpful in their own circumstances. And um, until you have the opportunity to try and see what feels comfortable to you, um, you might not know which is the best one to, to, to get a hold of and purchase. The U-Step walker was designed specifically for people with uh, Parkinson's disease, especially um, the forward propulsion movements that sometimes are um, unsteady. And then there are a lot of people talking about and touting the upright type walkers, which work for some, but not for everybody uh, for posture control. Transfer poles, pivot discs that help if your feet are stuck to the ground or frozen, uh, bed rails, these kind of things can be very helpful for some of the bed mobility and the transfers in and out of bed. And then patient lifts uh, should be considered. So that might be anything as simple as a lift recliner, which works very well under many circumstances, to some more elaborate lift machinery, some of which is manual, some of which is electronic or um, uh, electrically powered, um, some of which enable you to use your feet on the floor, others of which would lift you if you had no power in your legs. So um, depending on what your status is, uh, whether your blood pressure is managed, what your um, home environment rooms are like, how much your care provider can help you, um, there are different factors that come into de uh, making decisions about what is best for you. And you will wanna know about how it's covered too from uh, an insurance standpoint. So scooters can be helpful, especially out in the community. The seating systems are not particularly um, supportive for an individual who needs more posture support or has trouble with orthostatic hypotension. A power wheelchair with a tilt type of a feature is very helpful. And of course there are manual chairs um, that are easy, uh, but not able to be independently used by the, uh, the rider. Um, both some that are easy to put in the back of the car and others that are more elaborate and supportive, um, uh, especially again for the posture support or the head group that might be um, uh, needing to be accommodated. So durable medical equipment is used to improve your safety, your mobility, and to help your uh, care provider help you um, move safely in different circumstances. The symptoms will change. Uh, the um, DME you are using might need to be reassessed um, and therapists and physicians um, um, are involved in the process of doing the right documentation, making the right decisions about what's good for you and, and uh, teeing things up for insurance uh, coverage. Occupational therapists will be a little bit more focused on hands and hand function, including eye-hand coordination, they're experts at um, adaptation using either adaptive strategies or sometimes adaptive equipment to get the job done. And they're often involved in wheelchair seating. Occupational therapists know a lot about home modification as well. So there are some simple shower modifications that oftentimes people uh, figure out on their own, tub benches, handheld shower devices of different types, uh, grab bars. Um, and if um, uh, occupational therapists definitely can help guide you through some of this so that you can uh, make some good decisions in that regard. Um, this is a good example of a beautiful shower redesign and bathroom redesign, but this might cost thousands of dollars and many of us couldn't afford to do that or our homes wouldn't accommodate that. And so you'd have to think about something different instead for you. And just a brief example of um, uh, mistakes that could possibly be made. This is a walk-in tub, which under some circumstance would sound perfect for a person who'd lost the ability to get um, up and down from um, floor level in and out of a standard tub, but doesn't always work in the long run if a person loses the ability to kind of get in and out of that narrow space. So we would hope to try to find ways to not um, um, uh, um, spend money um, if it weren't going to be helpful for you in the long run. Um, uh, commodes can be used outside of the bathroom as can urinals. Um, bidets uh, can be a very inexpensive addition um, if there's ever a problem with some of the hand um, control for the hygiene. I've uh, never yet met a person who doesn't love having a bidet and bottom buddies. Again, just a variety of different types of adaptive equipment. 
And then um, stairs are challenging, whether they're inside the house or outside the house. If there's a time where you're using a wheelchair, um, it's going to be a little difficult getting up and down those stairs. So it's best to help um, think through some of these issues with somebody who's done it before and can point you in the right direction of finding something that's going to work for you in the long run. As a physician, um, I help with prescription writing for some of this durable medical equipment. Uh, my office note has to reflect that I've had conversations with my patients about the durable medical equipment and why they need it at this time. Um, uh, I do referrals for physical occupational therapy and speech therapy. Um, I do evaluations and treatment of pain. Sometimes people have bad shoulders or bad knees that pre-exist um, uh, getting MSA and we can still address some of those problems. And I do a fair amount of counseling. So I'm a, trained in physical medicine rehabilitation. I do this all the time. Um, and to be honest, these are not things that can't be done by both your neurologist or your primary care physician. It's just that they might not have the familiarity with it. Uh, you will find people to do this um, as, as needed. So durable medical equipment needs a face-to-face -face visit with the prescription person who's per doing the prescription but it also needs um, a lot of documentation. Um, this is an example of a wheelchair, portion of a wheelchair document um, that an insurance company wants to see all the uh, justification behind different features of the wheelchair. Very lengthy process. I talk with people about disability. So these conditions obviously can strike people uh, in their prime of life when they're still working. Um, for those people who have very physically taxing, challenging jobs, it might, they might not be able to continue doing those jobs. Uh, for others who have jobs that um, kind of are more involved with thinking and communicating, they can sometimes continue to do their job. These are things that we talk about continually. Are you still able to? How can I help you with the paperwork? Uh, where should we go with work decisions? And so disability, of course, is being unable to work, but seeking disability often involves a lot of paperwork, uh, usually with decisions um, and justification from a physician about what a person can and can't do. Um, there are both short-term and long-term disability policies that sometimes will come through the employer, uh, and there's always Social Security disability to fall back on for people who don't have um, disability through their employer. So again, um, a lot of decision-making, lots of counseling in this regard um, when we're together. So takeaway points, adaptation and resiliency are helpful as you go through um, the course of the journey of MSA. There will be times when you begin to struggle with an activity. It might be fitness, it might be personal care. Rehabilitation providers know how to assist you. A couple of resources, including one from the American Physical Therapy Association, which has a function about how to find a neurologic trained therapist near you. Um, you use your zip code and that information. Um, Social security uh, policies, um, aging in place helpful for some of the home modification issues. And um, the MSA coalition evaluation guide that you can get at the website has a lot of this information reiterated in it. So thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi everyone, my name is Renee Utansky and I am one of the speech language pathologists at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And it's an honor to be able to talk to you today about speech pathology's role in an MSA care team. And today I'll be focusing on communication. So I'll share that I have no disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. And start by acknowledging that speech pathologists address more than just speaking. We do also address thinking and swallowing. And one of my colleagues will be joining us uh, shortly to discuss the swallowing part of MSA care. But today I'll really be focusing on speaking. There are changes in speech that occur in the context of MSA, and we call these speech changes dysarthria, which is just the term that means that these changes in speech are coming from disease in the brain. The primary quality of the speech changes can vary with the type of MSA. So patients can experience a soft or a hoarse voice, uh, what's referred to as incoordinated or slurred speech, 
And the rate can either be faster or slower. And you can really see a combination thereof. The impact of these speech changes varies widely too. Some people or their communication partners may not even notice these changes at first. Uh, but these speech changes can become more noticeable and bothersome over time, which is really where our, our role can become uh, more noticeable. So how can speech pathology help? Our goal overall is to promote efficient and effective communication. So ensuring that patients can get their points across mm -hmm. with as little energy and frustration as possible. And so two primary areas that we address are repairing communication breakdowns and preparing for future changes. So I'll talk a little bit more about each of these. In terms of repairing communication breakdowns, uh, there are three main categories of suggestions. So ways that you can optimize the communication environment, things that the speaker or patient can do, and things that the listener or care partner can do. In terms of optimizing the communication environment, this is really making the most ideal space to have conversations. So the primary thing to consider is making sure that you're talking in the same room with the person you're talking to and talking face-to-face -face with them. Uh, it seems quite obvious when you think about it, but if you reflect on your day-to-day -day practice, you might be talking to each other from a different space. And so I think you'll find that narrowing that distance between you two can uh, promote more effective communication. It also includes being really mindful of distractions. So things like shutting off the TV or the ambient music, uh, asking family to minimize side conversations when you're in a larger group setting, and then maybe the less obvious things like not talking uh, while the sink is running and someone's washing dishes, which kind of creates that ambient noise, but also your backs typically turn to the person. Even if you have a, a non-human dishwasher, being mindful of the noise that that can create and trying to have your conversations away from that space. I mentioned there are things that the patient themselves can do to try and promote more uh, effective communication. And one strategy includes speaking loudly, slowly, and clearly. And this is really a, a broad recommendation. So if someone's sufficiently loud, then perhaps they wouldn't focus on that piece, um, but they would focus on speaking more slowly and clearly. I think one thing to add to that is the idea of pausing between each word as I'm demonstrating in a somewhat exaggerated fashion, but that allows the listener to know where one word ends and another word begins without them kind of blurring together. And it allows them to uh, more easily understand what's being said. This uh, goes in tandem with optimizing the communication environment and that's getting the listener's attention before speaking. So not just saying their name, but then making sure that they've stopped what they do, are doing, that they've turned to you and that you have their attention before going. This should minimize the need to repeat yourself. Some other things to consider are using something like a voice amplifier. And this is in particular if, if loudness is a challenge. Another option is using something like an alphabet board where an individual would point to the first letter of each word as they say it. And so it helps uh, practice that pausing between each word. And it also resolves uh, any confusion about what the first letter or sound of what was spoken might be. Some other things to be mindful are conserving energy. I think everyone uh, listening probably has some sense of the fatigue that can occur in, in MSA. And so uh, being mindful of that and minimizing the need to speak loudly, whether that's optimizing the environment or using a voice amplifier, um, resting before and after periods of high voice use, 
and really being mindful of, of when your energy is highest. So scheduling phone calls and events accordingly, um, and maybe even using systems like Skype and FaceTime instead of a phone call. Um, you might be able, people might be able to better understand if they can see you speaking and that would minimize the need to repeat yourself and therefore conserve energy as well. What are some things that the care partner can do? Because so far we've, we've discussed a lot of things that put a lot of uh, responsibility on, on the patient or the speaker. So I'd encourage you as, as partners to face your, the person who's speaking and minimize your multitasking, really give your full attention to them um, so that you can use all of your resources to better understand what they're saying. I'd also avoid the question what, so which you might uh, recognize you use commonly. Instead, kind of restate the part of the message that you heard. So if you heard something was said, uh, you might recognize that you got the first part. So you could repeat, I heard you needed me to get you something. What was it? And ask that clarifying question in a way that uh, minimizes the need to repeat the whole sentence, but just the single word that you didn't get. The other role of the speech pathologist in this care team is preparing for future changes. And that includes several different uh, avenues for communication. The first is voice or message banking. And so voice banking is what we use uh, to create a personalized synthetic voice. And so if you were to ever have to use uh, augmentative or alternative communication, so that means maybe typing something on a phone or a tablet that then speaks or verbalizes that on your behalf, um, instead of having a generic voice like an Alexa or a Siri, it would sound more like you. The other is message banking, where you would have recordings of your voice. And so these are the things that you want to sound like you and not a synthesized version of yourself. So like a recording of your laugh, your favorite jokes or sayings or stories, terms of endearment for your family and whatnot. And so we'd encourage you to do this sooner rather than later, ideally before you have any speech changes at all, uh, but certainly once you've started to notice the more subtle changes. I mentioned these augmentative and alternative communication strategies, uh, like using a tablet or a phone, but there are a, there's a broad spectrum of these as well. So sometimes doing something like writing with pen to paper is a sufficient way to repair communication breakdowns if people are having difficulty understanding your spoken communication. Something like a boogie board can also be helpful. It's an LCD tablet where you write on it and then you push a button and it clears it so that you don't have to worry about running out of a pen or paper. These are just some examples of those phone or tablet speech generating apps I mentioned. And there are more complex systems, uh, particularly for patients with reduced hand control. So you may have seen something like eye gaze uh, in the news and that is an option for patients with MSA. I think part of our role also is to help monitor for other changes, um, making sure that these systems that you have in place, uh, when they're no longer working, we can find new ones in the event of other motor symptoms or cognitive or thinking changes and helping you make that transition and shift from maybe more speaker focused strategies to listener and environment focused strategies. I hope I've provided you with a sufficient overview of the role of speech language pathology and maybe even some suggestions for what you can take away today uh, to improve communication. I look forward to answering any questions you might have in the discussion portion. Take care. Welcome, my name is Katherine Shonley. I am a speech language pathologist at Mayo Clinic. My name is Adele Pattinson, a clinical dietitian at Mayo Clinic. And we are here today to share some information on swallowing and nutrition considerations in multiple system atrophy. Briefly, um, neither of us have any relevant financial or non-financial relationships to disclose. Um, so I'm going to share some information on swallowing today centered around this term dysphagia, um, which can simply be defined as difficulty with swallowing. This is a very complication with multiple system atrophy. 
Uh, swallowing is typically broken down into three phases. First, we have the oral phase, which involves chewing, um, preparing the food to be swallowed, moving food from the front of the, uh, the mouth to the back. Um, the next phase is the pharyngeal phase. This is when the food is moving out of the oral cavity, through the throat, and to the opening of the esophagus. Um, difficulty in this phase of swallowing can lead to aspiration, which is material entering the lungs instead of the esophagus. And it is something we'll revisit later in this presentation. Um, also muscle weakness um, in this phase can lead to material sticking in the throat after swallowing. Um, the third phase is the esophageal phase, which is typically not impacted in MSA. So we will not be spending time on that today. So um, symptoms of dysphagia can differ between the variants in MSA. In the MSA-C variant, which is um, characterized predominantly by cerebellar ataxia, patients tend to struggle more with bolus formation and transport. And when I say that, I mean a bolus um, is the bite or sip of food that you've taken. Um, and so patients tend to kind of struggle with keeping a cohesive bite or sip in their mouth. Um, in the MSAP variant with predominant Parkinsonism, uh, reduced trunk, tongue pressure or strength and slower oropharyngeal transit tend to be present. So um, this can lead to material sticking in the throat and also leaves patients at greater risk for aspiration or material entering the lungs, um, which can lead to a pneumonia. Overall, in this variant, um, there is typically more rapid deterioration of swallow function. So um, what signs or symptoms might you or those around you notice if you're beginning to have difficulty with swallowing? Um, there may be coughing and choking, that classic kind of down the wrong pipe sensation. Some will notice food or pills sticking in their throat, um, needing to wash things down with, with sips of liquid. Um, or swallow numerous times to get food down. Um, some will notice pooling of liquid or food in their mouth after they swallow. And then also um, not related to the actual meal time, but some will um, exhibit a pneumonia. Uh, I think it's important to mention though that pneumonia can be a sign of possible aspiration, but not all pneumonias are associated with aspiration. If you're noticing changes in your swallowing that concern you, I would encourage you to talk to your doctor um, and this can be evaluated in several ways. Um, you'd be sent to a speech pathologist and we first could perform a clinical evaluation of swallowing, which is simply, simply observing you um, eat and drink a few different consistencies. Another evaluation is a video fluoroscopic swallow study, which um, the image on the left is actually a still from a video swallow study. And this is essentially an X-ray of swallowing with you swallowing different consistencies of barium. The third evaluation is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or fees, which is observing the swallow um, with a small camera um, put through the nose and looking down at the throat. During all of these uh, evaluations, we may try strategies to see if we can improve swallowing safety and ease. There's uh, unfortunately no evidence um, for effective treatment of dysphagia in MSA. And when I say treatment, I mean exercises or medications that can improve swallowing. Um, so it's best managed via compensatory strategies such as diet alterations, um, avoiding items that may, may be more challenging to chew, more likely to stick in the throat. Um, liquids may be thickened to reduce the risk of aspiration. There's also swallowing strategies, such as alternating bites and sips, clearing the throat, simply slowing down during meals, and also postural changes, such as a chin tuck or a head turn. Um, some patients um, do opt for a feeding tube when swallowing becomes too much of a struggle. Um, and with that, I'm gonna step aside for Adele to continue. Thank you, Catherine. General guidelines for nutrition and multi-system atrophy are to minimize weight loss and to help patients swallow as safely and efficiently as possible. Nutritional goals can identify calorie, protein, and fluid targets, but 
remember to set reasonable goals to try to decrease the pressure of eating. This can include small meals with food texture modifications as needed and spacing of fluid intake throughout the day to ensure adequate hydration. Calorie goals are based on activity. I usually do not ask families to count calories, but often they want a number to better assess calorie intake in very general terms. For protein goals, try to aim for about a half a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Sometimes people aim, have a, try to set goals that are too high and this is not necessary. Fluid intake can be, can be decreased when swallowing difficulty arises leading to dehydration, which can cause weakness and even confusion. A standard range for fluid intake is about 48 to 64 ounces a day. When looking at protein intake, I've given a couple examples. If you're daunted by thinking about 75 or 80 grams of protein a day, think four ounces of meat, which is about a deck of cards, is about 32 grams. An ounce or eight ounce glass of milk is eight grams. One ounce of cheese is seven grams. Nutritional intake can change as the disease process changes. Be aware of possible be aware of possible changes and help and, and help make the adjustment. The changes can first can start from a standard soft diet to one with texture, texture modifications, and then on to needing nutritional shakes for more calories, and then possibly needing to supplement the oral diet with tube feedings. And finally, if oral intake is very difficult, someone may need to depend on tube feeding only. What is a modified texture diet? You might've heard uh, Catherine talk about this. After a clinical swallow evaluation, you may hear some of these terms. Uh, diced, ground, soft, puree, thin liquid, nectar liquid. Most of the above are self-explanatory diced, ground, and puree, which can be done with most um, kitchen appliances or, or a table knife. When it comes to thickening liquids, this can be a little more tricky. There are several liquid uh, beverage thickeners on the market and a speech pathologist or dietitian can recommend um, an option. Note that when you get to honey or pudding thick liquids, this can be difficult to consume in quantities enough to maintain hydration. Thin liquids are similar to milk, water, tea, and coffee, and nectar thick liquids can be some nutritional shakes, some nectar juices, um, and some vegetable juices. Nutritional shakes, there are many options on the market. They are used for weight loss, weight gain, athletic events, and even recovery. If you have a preference for a certain flavor or type of ingredient, you most likely can find one that will work for you. They can provide 250 to 530 calories in an eight ounce serving. They could be vegan or, or plant-based or organic. They also can be purchased online or you can make many options at home. Beware of the very high protein shakes as some are low in carbohydrates and often calories. Patients will drink one or more of these a day, meet their protein needs, but come nowhere near to meeting calorie needs. The goal of using this type of product is to provide more calories and protein. The best time to discuss a feeding tube is before it's needed. Allow yourself and your family to change their mind in the future as well. Most often the decision to place a feeding tube is made when the swallowing ability continues to decline, meals are taking longer and weight loss is present. A gastrostomy or stomach tube is the type of feeding tube usually placed. Note it can be used for more than just nutrition. It can be used for hydration and medication administration as well. No special equipment is needed uh, to use a feeding tube such as a feeding pump or machine into the stomach. I have a couple pictures of the common types of gastrostomy tubes. The one on the left has an, a soft internal bumper. The one on the right has a liquid filled balloon. This is a skin level or low profile device that you attach the extension set on the right to be able to administer food, nutrition, or medications. I'm often asked, is tube feeding covered? It's usually covered when difficulty swallowing is present and often a swallow ev evaluation is required. This is included with Medicare, Medicaid, medical advantage plans and private insurance. In summary, monitor swallowing changes, decrease nutritional intake and weight loss. Communicate these changes with your healthcare team and ask questions based on the medical plan of care so that necessary further steps, steps can be taken. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Dr. Claudia Chow, and I'm joined by Dr. Laura Reed to discuss the role of palliative medicine in MSA. We have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk are to define palliative medicine and to discuss the role of palliative medicine in the care of patients with MSA. What is palliative medicine? It is a team-based model of care for patients with advanced or progressive illness, and it focuses on providing relief from the symptoms and distress of that illness through preventing or relieving suffering. Palliative medicine is comprised of a number of core team members, which includes physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, chaplains, and social workers. So we know that when patients come to see palliative medicine for the first time, they may come with a lot of emotion, worry, and anxiety. We recognize that a lot of patients have never met with palliative medicine before. And so we try to emphasize the things that we do in our clinic. We are multidisciplinary, we are patient and family centered, and we focus on quality of life. We are not synonymous with giving up. You have not been referred to us just because there are no other options available and we are not synonymous with hospice. Hospice is a type of care that does focus on quality of life, symptom management, and support for patients and their caregivers. Hospice is something that patients select often when they are thought to be in the last six months of their lives. And hospice does have some regulations regarding the care that can be provided. Palliative medicine may also be called palliative care or supportive care, depending on which institution you're at. These are all essentially synonymous. The goal of palliative care is to improve quality of life for both patients and their care partners. We recognize that quality of life means different things to different people. And so we seek to understand what's most important to you so we can deliver the best care possible. Why does palliative medicine make sense for patients with MSA? We know that neurologic conditions such as MSA can have a high symptom burden. MSA changes over time and our patients have different needs over time. MSA patients may be faced with different decisions regarding their care, and we know that MSA affects not just the patient, but also their family and their care partners. When is the ideal time to involve palliative medicine? We know that palliative medicine is based on a patient's needs and not their prognosis. It is available for patients at any age of illness and at any stage. It can be provided alongside curative treatment and with clinical trials. I like this graphic here because it emphasizes a lot of those key points. One, that palliative medicine can be involved from the time of diagnosis, and also that as a patient's needs change, our care changes to meet those needs up through the end of life and sometimes even after with bereavement support for patients uh, surviving loved ones. I will transition it now to Dr. Ree for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Now that we spent a few minutes talking about what palliative care is, we'd like to talk a little bit about what palliative care can offer you. For any of you have, that have been in our clinic, you may have heard me explain things uh, in this type of perspective. You have several team members that will be involved in your care, and a lot of those team members have very specific focuses, such as your speech pathologist will be focused primarily on your speech and swallowing, and your physical therapist will be focused on your function. We in palliative care kind of like to take a step back and look at things from more of a global perspective. We like to talk to you about how you're doing in the context of your illness, but also taking into account your environment and your social supports. We pay very close attention to the symptoms that you're experiencing and try to improve those as much as possible. We also spend a great deal of time talking about how you're coping with the disease and also assessing how your caregiver is handling things. Last, we also do a lot of advanced care planning and trying to help you plan for the future. In thinking about symptom management specifically, we want to provide relief from the symptoms that you're having with the goal of preventing suffering. We talk a lot about the experience that you have in living with MSA, and this really varies from patient to patient. We certainly recognize that MSA affects not only your physical health, but also your emotional and spiritual health. Our goal is to keep you as active and engaged as possible for as long as possible.
When we think about assessing symptoms, we certainly recognize that there are more than just the physical components that contribute to that symptom. For example, as we think about pain, we know that there are many things that contribute to physical pain. But there's also attributes of social pain, psychological pain, and spiritual pain that all come together to really uh, define that symptom experience. Dr. Kuhn shared this visual with you earlier, and I just wanted to highlight it again to show that MSA can cause many symptoms and affects lots of different systems in the body. Thus, it often takes many different providers with areas of expertise to really treat all of these symptoms. As we think about some of the knowledge that we've gained from treating MSA in the past few years here, we have grown to learn a lot of information. As we talk to patients about their distress, we know that it is often uh, rivals that of cancer. The average level of distress in the patients that we've seen is approximately a four on a zero to 10 scale with zero being no distress and 10 being unbearable distress. We have noticed that the level of distress tends to be higher in women. Some of the physical symptoms that we more commonly treat may include constipation, fatigue, and discomfort. We also spend a lot of time talking about depression, anxiety, and demoralization. That last term you may, may be a little less familiar with, but this is one that I hear very commonly in patients that have MSA. Demoralization is essentially feeling like you're losing yourself, the things that make you you. And so we do spend an great deal of time talking about this. And we treat these symptoms with often a combination of medications, so pharmacologic ways, and also non-medication things. We know that this disease, again, is very distressing. And so we talk a lot about how you're coping with this disease. We will review ways, ways that you've historically coped and also talk about building new coping skills. We also recognize that this disease extends beyond just the patient and certainly affects their family and entire support system. So screening for caregiver distress is very important. I'm not going to get into this too much because I really encourage all of you to stay tuned for an upcoming talk by Erin and Abraham, who are a palliative chaplain and social worker. They're going to delve into this a bit more. Because we know that MSA changes over time, we do want to spend some time talking about planning for the future. While we are learning a lot more about MSA, it's still very difficult to give an individual prognosis. We do try to talk to patients about what they can expect in the future. We know that it is very likely that you as a patient may need more help with your mobility and activities of daily living. So the things that we have to do every day, like go to the bathroom, feed ourselves, brush our teeth and bathe. As we think about those things over time, it is important to factor in who's going to be able to provide that extra level of support to you. Advanced care planning many things. In my personal opinion, one of the most important pieces of advanced care planning is appointing a surrogate decision maker. That means choosing someone who could make medical decisions on your behalf if you were ever in the situation that you couldn't. You should choose someone who knows you well and who could honor your wishes. It is really important to have these conversations, and this is often not a single conversation, but may evolve over time. I know these conversations can be quite difficult, but I would encourage each of you to look at this as a gift to your family. I've certainly been present in many situations where the family had to make medical decisions and really did not know the wishes of the patient. This can be really distressing. And so if I can encourage you to have those conversations with your family, um, please do so. While patients are completing advanced care planning, they often choose to also complete other forms of planning, such as financial power of attorney, 
wills, trusts, or estate planning. When we talk specifically about completing your advanced care plan for medicine, there are many different options. The one pictured here is our Mayo specific advanced care planning guide, but most all states and even most all healthcare systems have their very own advanced care plan. This does often require a notary or witness signatures. And really, I would encourage you to discuss these plans with your medical team. I did want to highlight one specific advanced care plan. This is called Five Wishes. I like this one because it really seems to resonate with patients. As we mentioned earlier, I think a very important piece is naming your surrogate decision maker, which this document does. And then it provides prompts to talk about the different types of medical care that you would want, but also really highlights what is most important to you as a person. It forms these statements in I wish statements, such as, I wish my medical team knew this about me. I wish my family knows this is most important to me. This is a guide that is readily available on the internet, should you wish to look into it further. With MSA changing over time, sometimes we are asked to make some difficult decisions. Some of the decisions that MSA patients may specifically face may include things like feeding tubes or tracheostomies. These are deeply personal decisions for each individual. And it is not our job as medical providers to talk you in or out of these things, but it is our job to make sure you have all the necessary information to help you make these decisions. We should also make sure that you understand the realistic outcomes of each of these decisions so that you are best prepared to make them. These discussions should happen with your medical teams, but also in conjunction with your family. Some other difficult decisions that patients may have to face is transitioning out of the home setting. We know that MSA changes over time and certainly can create difficulties in remaining in the home setting. Sometimes patients have to face going into an assisted living or long-term care facilities. Hospice is also something that we may discuss over time. All of these decisions are best made in advance before a crisis happens. One last question that you might be considering is how can I get palliative medicine? I always think it's wise to talk over your wishes with your family, but second to that, talk it to your medical providers there locally. Palliative medicine used to be primarily provided at academic medical decision, academic medical centers, but this is really changing. A lot of times palliative resources are available to you locally. So again, I would encourage you to talk with your local neurology team or palliative medicine or primary care provider to determine if this resource exists for you. Last, we did want to provide a handout to you today that summarizes some of the key points that we've discussed. And also we've listed a few websites that might help direct you to further information. We really appreciate your time and being able to speak with you today. Good morning. Um, I am Erin Taylor. I'm a social worker in the outpatient palliative care clinic, and this is my colleague, uh, good morning. I'm Abraham. I'm Labrador Santiago. I'm one of the palliative care chaplains here at Mayo. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about chaplaincy and social work within the outpatient palliative clinic. Um, and we work a lot with MSA patients within the neurology um, clinic as well. So we are first going to talk about connectedness. Um, we thought it would be nice to just talk about kind of the overlap between social work and chaplaincy. There's definitely overlap kind of with, within all of our disciplines within the outpatient palliative clinic, but definitely a lot of similarities between social work and chaplaincy. And so we kind of developed this list um, of things that we both kind of do. Um, there's minute differences, but definitely similarities. So we're, we're both trained to use intensive listening skills to focus on spirit and spirituality within the body, mind, and spirit of a person and family. We engage the patient and family in a conversation about the individual's life in review. So we really focus on 
the past, present, and kind of what's important for the future and kind of how that all ties together. We assess strengths, resources, and stressors that are going on in a patient and family's life and figure out how we can kind of best provide support both to the patient, family, and caregiver. We initiate, build, and sustain helping relationships through the care continuum. Um, we work within the IDT team to ensure patients' needs are being met. And this is both evident in the hospital practice and in the outpatient clinic, working really well as a team to communicate what we need to kind of to our colleagues to make sure that, that there's a piece of the patient's care that um, isn't being unmet. We provide supportive care and counseling to patients, families, and staff. We definitely deal a lot with crisis care, um, both from a spiritual standpoint and a social work standpoint, and again, support the family through that. We do a lot of facilitation of grief and anticipatory grief and kind of talking about the differences between depression and grief, um, what's able to be treated with medication and more what's normal and, and benefits from just kind of talk and support. We utilize an integrative intervention to reduce acute anxiety and pain which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a few minutes. And then we definitely focus and have a sensitivity to um, respect for diversity of culture, religious faith, spiritual traditions, and even those with no spiritual tradition. Um, I just want to share a little bit, a brief overview of the palliative medicine chaplain. <clears throat> Uh, within the interdisciplinary team goal of the chaplain is to set amidst as possible the spiritual needs of patients and their families. Uh, this is very subject, very personal. This is different for everyone, but the goal is to reduce spiritual and existential suffering and improve quality of life. Uh, there is a, sometimes there is assumptions about chaplaincy and how it plays in the religious realm. But in reality, we want to explore spirituality in the fundamental human way, which means that everybody has a different take on it. And we are qualified to explore those uh, aspects of spirituality. So one of the things that you can expect from a chaplain in the palliative care is to have a safe space to explore the patient connection to the sacred or the things that are meaningful and transcendental. This is open to people with or without a religious preference or a spiritual practice. So that means that anybody who has uh, a need to explore these things can do it in a safe, in a safe space. Uh, Spiritual-based counseling with the aim to allow expression of emotions related to spiritual stress or to re reinforce spiritual wellness. Uh, many patients that I see or, I, or families that I talk to need to share about their spiritual journey not necessarily in a religious uh, context, but also but in the way they see the world. And I heard a phrase not too long ago that says that spirituality uh, is the extraordinary part of our ordinary lives. And I believe that's very important to explore. And we, we are not only here to assess distress, but also to really reinforce that spiritual wellness that uh, people have already. And I think that's a very particular distinction. We are not here to fix anything. We're here to provide, uh, we, I call it an anchor in a time of uh, a difficult situation. And you know, patients with MSA go to difficult transitions and we want to be there for them uh, and connect with them as well. Uh, one of the things that I do as well is facilitate ritual spiritual practices that are congruent with patients' belief systems. So that means that for some patients, it's very important to have a prayer, meditation, just connection with somebody in a deeper way, just like uh, Aaron was saying previously, that connection is very important because it will allow us to kind of release some of those difficult emotions and as well as to find that human connection. Because we understand that going through these difficult transitions is very challenging. And also a lot of people, especially with during this uh, last year, found themselves very isolated. So part of my role has been to really find a place for them to connect to, with their beliefs and also to reinforce um, one of the things that these rituals help with is, is like create this bridge between a crisis and a transformation. So I think we providing that is very essential for us. Uh, for some people who don't have a spiritual practice, I like to talk to them about what's meaningful and particularly the things that they do in their routine routine life and how these changes uh, can affect that and how can we find a coping strategy more than a coping mechanism. 
And one of the things that we're offering in our clinic as well as the a legacy project, which is a generativity document where we talk about, we have with a structure live review document where we can talk about a lot of patients have, a, they, they feel some distress about how are they going to be remembered when they are approaching end of life. And we're trying to offer this uh, document, which is going to reflect their story and we'll provide them with them with a, with the means to tell their family, their loved ones, who they are and the hopes for them, the, the memories they want to share with them. This has proven to reduce some existential distress um, because one of the questions in life is, uh, at the end of life, is how I'm going to be remembered. So this has been successful, in my opinion, with the patients that we had. Uh, one of the things that I want to make sure is that you know chaplaincy is very inclusive, is very accepting of people's beliefs and spiritual expressions. And we are here to provide a safe space for you. So I'm going to talk um, just briefly kind of about the specific role of social work. And so um, the goal of social work within the interdisciplinary team is to provide whole person family centered care to patients living with serious illness. Seeing each person as a whole person including physical comfort, confidence, emotional well-being, spirituality, and dignity. So um, I, I focus on this usually when I meet with patients and families for the first time by doing what I call a comprehensive psychosocial assessment. So sometimes patients are kind of like, well, why are you asking me all these questions about my social history? What does that have to do with anything? Um, but it ends up to be really important in getting to know patients and families and seeing how um, both social work and chaplaincy, how we can be helpful in supporting patients and families. Um, I address existential and emotional distress, which often comes from feeling unheard. I find this a lot with patients dealing with real chronic illness. Um, you know, they meet with their physician and they talk about the diagnosis and kind of what symptoms are happening and their, their appointments sometimes are are quick and then they're out the door. Patients sometimes have a, have this sense of feeling unheard that there's a lot of unspoken thoughts and feelings and, and they don't really get to process that with anybody. Within palliative medicine, we have the time um, to really hear you and hear, hear kind of what you're struggling with, what's important to you um, and what is most helpful. Um, acknowledging the vulnerability of the patient and caregiver and really advocate for their needs. Um, social work uses a strengths-based focus, and so I ask a lot of questions kind of based on um, how you've coped with things in the past, what sorts of supports have you or your caregiver relied on in the past to build resiliency. Oftentimes people aren't even aware of their own strengths, and so it's a really important thing to be able to acknowledge um, what strengths a patient and family has. Part of my role is to follow the patient and family through the continuum of care. And so definitely meeting with patients um, who are newly diagnosed with MSA kind of through their disease progression has been a really important part of support for patients and families knowing at one stage of the MSA diagnosis, what is helpful kind of, and then as things progress, what kind of conversations do we need to have to be supportive through that continuum of care? So a big focus of um, both social work and chaplaincy through the MSA diagnosis and in a palliative medicine clinic is caregiver distress. So caregivers are often the forgotten person in the care team and palliative medicine really tries to recognize that. And so we spend a lot of time talking to the caregiver, acknowledging what stressors they have. Um, and we attempt to address caregiver needs and provide emotional support and wellness. I think that's a big thing that both Abraham and I do is to focus on wellness and what sorts of things can caregivers build into their day or week or month um, that can kind of fill their bucket and fill their cup so that they're able to continue to provide good care um, for the patient. So we assist caregivers in identifying, protecting and maximizing their own physical and emotional health, both for themselves and then to lessen the, the patient's sense that his or her needs are causing harm to the patient or caregiver. That's often a, a stressor that um, isn't always acknowledged is that patients have this sense that they're being a burden to their family. 
And so being able to kind of talk through that and, and giving the caregiver permission to take care of themselves often gives the patient a big sense of relief. Um, so we do that through supportive counseling. We're able to talk about resources such as psychological services, support groups, home health care, different web or phone supports. Um, we encourage the caregiver to communicate with the physician or the nurse regarding disease process, including any distressing symptoms um, or uncertainty about the disease trajectory. We really try to talk about any, any questions that the caregiver might have. Again, sometimes when you get in front of the doctor and meet, you have all these questions and then all of those are forgotten um, until you leave. And so we're able to sit with patients and caregivers and definitely write out questions that we can go back to the doctor and help them navigate those. We also to help facilitate goals of care conversations between patient caregivers, family and the care team. We really wanna um, make sure that patients' wishes are being followed and that their, their voice is being heard so that they feel that their, um, their wishes are being, are being um, understood. Um, when I meet with patients and families, I try to focus on mental health as well. And so definitely loss of independence and functional impairment, distressing symptoms can lead to depression and anxiety. So I try to screen um, patients for depression and anxiety when I meet with them and, and talk about how these symptoms can impact decision making in regards to treatment preferences. And that's important um, as again, as the disease progresses that we're making decisions honoring the patient's wish that are not being influenced by any mental health diagnosis. So I identify these symptoms. I can help advocate for them through non-pharmacologic interventions, both advocate with the doctor for pharmaco pharmacologic interventions, um, but I do focus on relaxation, guided imagery, supportive counseling, and psychotherapy. And then as Abraham shared, we both work on um, kind of identity and meaning exploration. Another part that I focus on in the clinic is planning for the future. So we know as MSA progresses that there are many things that can change, including the care needs. And so we kind of talk about planning for the future um, kind of in a crisis, anti-crisis uh, management mode. And so we focus on kind of the things that we can control and what we can do now. And so we talk about financial planning, long-term disability, social security disability, um, estate planning, and then asset assessments through the county. We talk about advanced care planning, again, to honor patients' wishes. And then we can talk through resource navigation, such as private agencies, county resources, informal supports, relying on um, friends, family, religious, or spiritual communities. So I hope that that was a pretty good overview of social work and chaplaincy. Um, and we will be meeting again to go through any questions that you guys have in the next um, few minutes. Well, thank you for listening to our presentation. And one of the things that I will want to say to MSA patients and their families is that our team is here for you. And this whole person care model is, uh, is for you. And so if you're able to utilize it, the tools that we are giving you and you have questions, please let us know. I'm Tricia Stevens, a neurology nurse and member of the MSA care team. Today, we've heard excellent presentations by other care team members. In the next several minutes, my goal is to describe how another member, the nurse, facilitates communication with the patient. I'm going to do so by providing four examples, the pre-visit phone call, the MSA clinic visit, the virtual patient education, and follow-up communication with the patient via online messaging or telephone. These are the learning objectives for this short presentation. Describe when the nurse communicates with the patient and identify information shared during patient education. The nurse's communication with the patient begins with a pre-visit phone call. The purpose is threefold. First, to explain the MSA care team approach. Second, is to provide contact information should questions arise. And third, is to gather information about recent patient symptoms. 
questions regarding patient symptoms align with the Unified Multiple System Atrophy Rating Scale, or UMSARS-1, as it is more commonly known. Questions focus on areas which can be affected by MSA. These include speech, swallowing, handwriting, cutting foods, using eating utensils, hygiene, dressing, walking, falls, orthostatic symptoms, as well as urinary, sexual, and bowel function. The severity of each symptom is rated on a scale from zero to four, with zero being normal and four complete loss of function. Questions regarding a history of dream enactment behavior, the presence of strider, which is a high-pitched noise made while breathing, and the use of a breathing machine are also asked. In addition, patients are asked about their interest in being a study participant. This information is documented in the patient's chart and shared with other care team members. It often prompts the physician to order additional appointments or tests. The nurse calls the patient before each subsequent visit to the MSA clinic and asks the same questions. Patient responses are compared to previous ones and help the physician determine disease progression. These phone calls are very useful since the nurse obtains a great deal of information. However, they're not without their challenges. For example, it's often very difficult to understand a patient with severe speech difficulties, and frequently a spouse or a family member will need to step in to answer the questions for the patient. On the day of the MSA clinic visit, the patient undergoes evaluations by physicians in neurology, palliative medicine, which focuses on improving quality of life, and any other necessary specialty. The team meets before and after these evaluations to discuss specific patient needs. It's helpful for the nurse to be present during the consultation, as it is the best way to stay informed of disease progression and plan of care. This is especially helpful when the patient contacts us with questions later. At the clinic visit, the physician determines when the patient should return for follow-up. Typical follow-up visits are at three or six month intervals, but maybe sooner if needed. If the physicians determine there is reasonable certainty of an MSA diagnosis, a virtual nurse patient education is scheduled for one to two weeks later. The delay allows the patient time to consider the information they received at their clinic appointments, to discuss it with family members, and to prepare questions. Family participation and patient education is encouraged since often a family member will become the patient's primary caregiver. During the virtual education, several male clinic resources are reviewed. I will discuss only three of the most helpful during this presentation. The multiple system atrophy resource is the most beneficial in explaining the disease. It provides details of brain involvement, different types of MSA and their associated symptoms, as well as typical diagnostic tests, diagnostic criteria, and treatment options. The resource orthostatic hypotension is also very helpful. Many MSA patients experience orthostatic hypotension, which is a drop in blood pressure when changing from a sitting to a standing position. This change in blood pressure may result in many different symptoms, the most common being dizziness or lightheadedness with weakness, which may lead to a fainting episode. This resource provides recommendations for mitigating the blood pressure drop, which includes optimizing fluid and salt intake, the use of compression garments, counter maneuvers such as crossing the legs, and water boluses in which the patient drinks 16 ounces of cold water quickly. The resource palliative care explains recommendations which might be made by the palliative care physicians to improve quality of life. The nurse explains that in the setting of MSA, as a chronic disorder with no cure, palliative care offers an extra layer of support and not end-of-life care. Other resources reviewed cover a wide range of topics and provide recommendations regarding dietary, urinary, and fall prevention issues. In addition, they discuss patient and caregiver stress. And after all the resources have been reviewed, the patients or family members ask questions. Common questions often focus on how quickly the disease will progress. 
And since disease progression varies from patient to patient, this is often a difficult question to answer. After the patient education, the patient is encouraged to contact members of the care team via online messaging or telephone if they have further questions. And the MSA patients are usually very good about providing status updates. Depending on the complexity of follow-up questions, they may be answered by the nurse or forwarded to the neurologist for a response. In conclusion, MSA patients are cared for by a multidisciplinary care team at Mayo Clinic, and each care team member has a specific role. My goal has been to describe how the nurse facilitates communication with the patient. I've provided four examples, the pre-visit phone call, the MSA clinic visit, the virtual patient education, and follow-up communication with the patient via online messaging or telephone. In my view, the nurse has a pivotal role in the collaborative effort to provide individualized care for each MSA patient. Thank you for your time. Please feel free to ask me questions. Hi everyone, thank you for joining this session. My name is Liz Dias and I am a board member from the MSA Coalition. I'm joined by many faces here on screen from the Mayo Clinic, as well as my co-moderator, Dr. Karina Perator, who's on our General Advisory Council. Um, I'd ask all of the attendees, please continue asking your questions in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll try to get to all of your questions in the next 20 minutes. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it to Karina to ask the first few questions to the team from, from Mayo. So thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Liz. So yes, we had quite a few questions. Um, first one I'd like to ask is more geared toward um, Dr. Rene um, from the audience. Do you have suggestions on who to contact for voice message banking? It's a great question. I think there's two ways to go about this. There are a lot of things that um, a patient along with their family might be uh, comfortable to do on their own. So there are some websites I put in the chat. Acapella and Model Talker um, is a pretty self-guided way to pursue voice banking and message banking can be done on pretty much any smartphone or um, tablet. But if you do have any trouble, I just recommend contacting a local speech language pathologist. Great, thank you. And then um, just a follow-up question to that um, for you as well. And what were the devices that are suggested for helping with speech? Sure, the way I'll interpret that question, I guess, is how can we augment or um, augment speech as opposed to work to improve speech? And um, there are a number of ways to go about doing that. I'm someone who very much um, likes to take uh, full advantage of the technology that patients are already very comfortable with. So there are a lot of apps that can be downloaded onto a smartphone or tablet that you already feel comfortable with. Um, but if more advanced uh, needs are in place with maybe motoric limitations, there are things like eye gaze devices that would be helpful. Um, and then even things like writing with pen to paper or other low tech options. So lots of things depending on the overall needs of the patient. Great, thank you. So the next question is for anyone on the panel. Can someone please explain head turn and eating issues? Does anyone want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I will. Great. Um, so I'm Catherine, I'm with Speech Pathology and a head turn is a strategy that we will sometimes recommend um, for patients with a variety of diagnoses. Um, sometimes, especially when a patient has unilateral, meaning weakness on one side of the body, unilateral weakness, turning to the weak side um, can sometimes direct to what you were eating or drinking down the stronger side of the throat, um, improving, um, airway protection or making things kind of move through more efficiently. Um, not to say that it only works with patients um, with one-sided weakness, um, but that's who I think of using it with. Um, it's, it's a strategy that works for some, but not, not everyone. 
but it can be helpful. Thank you. We did have quite a few questions around palliative care. So I'll direct this one to Dr. Cho. And um, someone was asking, they do have palliative care. Do they qualify for a chaplaincy support and how do they trigger it? Yeah, um, I think there were a number of questions about getting palliative care. And we've talked a lot about our system at Mayo where we have chaplaincy, social work, physicians, and all of those under other team members under one roof. I will say that is not the only way to do palliative care. I think something that everyone um, often has access to is their neurologist and their primary care physician. And that's really where a lot of palliative care starts um, with that medical team that knows you really well and can talk about those symptoms that are bothering you. And also with patients and their care partners talking about what's important to them. Those are hard conversations. Um, and sometimes maybe it's you know late at night or you're driving somewhere and have six hours of road ahead of you. Maybe that's a time to just start having those hard conversations about what does quality of life look like for me as I get sicker and as things get harder. So that's palliative care, really. That's the beginning parts of palliative care with some sort of medical care provider, again, who can be a primary care provider, um, a neurologist, and then you and your care partners. So I think that is a great place uh, to start. And then asking that neurologist and that primary care provider, what are the palliative care services in my area? Um, have you worked with them before? Who do you refer other patients um, to? Um, we can do palliative care in a number of different ways. A number of institutions do have social workers who can connect you with different resources and may provide some counseling options. They may have chaplains. So even if it's not under one roof, I think there are other ways to get access to these resources. And then thinking about other things, um, there is a website, getpalliativecare.org. Again, I can probably put it in the chat box, but getpalliativecare.org is a US-based um, website where you can search by your zip code and your city for different palliative care services, and then maybe try to talk to them to see if they could help you. Again, things are gonna look different institution to institution. So starting with your local resources is often the best way to go. Um, I think there was one other question that I saw on end of life logistics, and that's also a great palliative care uh, question. And so I think, again, kind of looking at each family member um, and what types of cares can be provided in the home. And if that's too hard and family members often do have a hard time um, providing care within the home, again, that differs patient to patient. So at that time, then there are discussions, is a skilled nursing facility gonna be the place where we can get the care that we need? Again, just really individualized um, conversations, patient to patient and often difficult conversations as well. Right, and you may have answered this follow-up question, but if a caregiver and a patient are in the Mayo MSA clinic, how would a caregiver be connected? I think you answered some of that to a palliative care social worker for caregiving counseling. Um, is this something they should request during their annual visit or patient portal? Yeah, you can certainly request that um, through the portal and then we can put through a visit to be seen with Erin. That should be pretty seamless, hopefully. Great, thank you. Um, so I have, just going back to the voice banking topic, um, someone was asking, how do you know when it is time to start voice banking? It is a challenging question um, because I think uh, speech changes are, I think it's fair to say not an inevitability for everyone. Um, and so we do consider it an insurance policy. I think when people are diagnosed with MSA and their voice is strongest and clearest, it's when we would encourage them to do it, um, knowing that they have it if they need it, and then they don't if they don't, or they have it even if they don't. Right. Um, and then just one more question to kind of loop back to the palliative care again. Um, is there a, a list of specific questions that are recommended for addressing with palliative care? For example, feeding tube. Do you want to take that one, Dr. Ree? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, 
I don't believe there is a specific list of questions necessarily, but I think that there are certain things that we uh, want to think about in regards to patients with MSA and certain decisions that we might anticipate um, them facing at some point in their future. And so we loop that in um, with advanced care planning, some of those, those important decision-making tasks that we uh, see coming. Feeding tube can certainly be one of those. I'm also talking about the difficulties that might arise in trying to stay in the home, if that is a patient's preference. Um, you know, what resources can we wrap to make that happen, or if that's not the patient's wish, um, what other types of planning can we help to put in place so that we have all of those decisions made before a crisis would occur, and then we're really scrambling to make those decisions. All right, um, and then we do have a, a member on the audience who's from Canada and has asked some specific questions about being in Canada. Um, they say, I'm not sure you know, but being a Canadian approval of devices such as feeding tubes may not be as easy. Do you know where approval can be sought? I guess this can go to Dr. Chow or Dr. Ree. Or we can follow up I, with that person later if we don't know the answer. <laughs> I think we may have to follow up later. I am sorry, I don't know the answer to that in Canada. Great. This is Adele from Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And I work in the tube feeding clinic. When we have had Canadian citizens, um, they've come to the United States and had a feeding tube. If they've gone back home, they've gone to their medical center and had it coordinated there. And we just um, offered advice and suggestions on what to do with the feeding tube once they had it. So it was done either in Canada or it was done here in the United States and then they returned. So, but I don't know specifically who they contacted. They went through their medical system. All right. Um, potentially we could follow up with this person after the event. Um, someone else is asking, what words of wisdom do you have for a patient who feels that they're ready for MAID, but the family is not? They capitalize MAID. So I'm not exactly sure what the acronym means or if it just means MAID. Um, I'll just put this out to the entire panel if someone wants to um, answer that question. So MAID or medical aid in dying um, may also be called physician assisted suicide. I think most commonly I've seen medical aid in dying. Um, that's a plan of care that's uh, more common on the West Coast. So I'm not as familiar with it here having practiced um, in the Midwest where we don't have that, not in Minnesota. I think the big thing to consider is that are there um, undertreated symptoms, um, depression, anxiety, pain, shortness of breath, anything that's making this level of suffering so high um, that a patient is wondering about medical aid in dying. And there are very specific protocols in the states um, that do um, permit this. And so I think it's always worth um, a very in-depth conversation with the patient and their loved ones. What's going on? What are we thinking? Um, and um, are there other things that we can do to try to alleviate symptoms? Got it, thank you. Um, this is another very kind of broad question to the entire group. Um, I believe it's probably from a patient who says, why do I feel so sick in the morning when I went to bed feeling okay? Is this a common, common theme that you have seen in your practice? This, this can be tough and there certainly can be variations to symptoms. Uh, when I hear that pattern, uh, I'm also uh, curious about orthostatic hypotension or low blood pressures. You know, and we know that uh, if blood pressures are a little high when we lie flat, especially overnight, that can lead to sending more blood and fluid to the kidneys, so we diurese. And then when we get up in the morning, that blood pressure can be really low. Oftentimes, patients with multiple system atrophy don't pick up or don't have those um, typical symptoms of lightheadedness, even when blood pressures can be very low. So that nausea could be a symptom of low blood pressure, and that's where checking that blood pressure during that time would, would be helpful, but also looking at other factors too, like medications in the morning, um, kind of other kind of food issues uh, would be important. Great, thank you. 
Um, another question that just came in, probably um, maybe for uh, Dr. Rene again, do you have suggestions, websites for ideas or examples of types of voice banking? Sure, I, I, I hate to default to just those two, um, acapella and model talker, but they are the ones with which I'm most familiar and patients have had really good success in um, being happy with the quality of the voice that's come out. Um, so I think those two would be great. But one other resource I can offer is maybe a list of suggestions for message banking rather than voice banking. So the types of phrases that we'd recommend patients record. And so I can actually add that if possible as an addendum handout to the conference organizers to share with participants. Mm -hmm. Things like um, your favorite jokes or your favorite story is terms of endearments for your loved one, your laugh. Uh, but I have maybe a more comprehensive list that might be helpful. Great. Um, and then here's a question who may be um, good for someone like Abraham or Catherine. Um, why do I have more alarmed feelings and fears about my condition when the night falls? Or to the entire group? <laughs> Maybe I can just talk briefly. Uh, I think the night is very difficult because there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with going to bed. And it kind of makes, uh, it's kind of a symbolical mortality at night because sometimes people are wondering, is this my last night? Is this, how are things going to be? And then when somebody's alone, the thoughts come more often. And I think uh, what we recommend in that kind of situation is to become a, to have a coping strategy, like an anchor that allows you to go to bed, knowing that you're doing your best and you're, you're being supported by family or other physicians or members of the team. But certainly, listen, I will say it's a very normal thing that happens to everybody who's going serious, through serious illnesses, just because uh, illness like this pr pr has a lot of uncertainty and the night increases that anxiety. Uh, but like I said, I will say having an anchor, like some people has a prayer or meditation, or they think about their family or a good memory they have during the day, uh, that has helped some people. But it's a very normal uh, feeling, I will say. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the group that wants to add to that? Okay. Well, we don't have any more questions coming into the queue at this time. Um, is there, are there any parting thoughts that any of you would like to share as we close out this panel discussion? Anything you think we didn't cover? Oh, yes, go ahead, Dr. Kuhn that you know, I'm really grateful for the dedication of my colleagues and, and this uh, really focusing on care for patients with multiple system atrophy and their caregivers. Um, I think there's a lot of interest also in the neuro neurologic community too to have more of these centers. Uh, and uh, I think that you know we are one place and, and there are likely a, a number of um, different centers and places where you can find your team. You can build the team members um, that will help support uh, patients as they go through this illness. Hey everyone, it's Liz again. I do think someone pointed out in the Q&A, there is a question that I tagged early on to answer and we haven't gotten to. So it actually was the first question we got earlier in the, the, uh, the session, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, person writes, so at this point, I've dropped most of my doctors and therapists. Uh, this is an incurable disease. I felt like I wasn't living, but spending my life in offices. I also felt like each one was just adding more medications. I exercise and try to eat well. I also do studies. Am I hurting or shortening my life quality by doing this or my quality of life by doing this? And this person also does have a palliative care doctor and a death doula. I don't know who would like to take that question. I will just throw out my thoughts that uh, no, I don't, I don't think that you are um, making bad choices in this. I think it sounds like you have really prioritized your quality of life. And really, that is what's most important, um, especially, um, you know, when you're facing an advanced disease like MSA. I would agree with that myself. I would say um, the phrase I sometimes discuss with patients is, what do you want to do with the time that is available to you? How do you want to spend that time? Thank you. And then another question here. 
um, from Vera, without MSA showing on the outside, how do you get the family or friends to understand you really do have something this bad when it comes to MSA? That's tough. And that can be something that comes up in some of the uh, clinic visits with patients who may be early in disease. Um, I would say that um, bringing along family members uh, can be helpful to clinic visits because sometimes they want to take a look at the brain MRI that, you know, that can be shown and, and things like that. So um, in my experience, just having, having people available for that, um, now with telemedicine, perhaps a telemedicine visit where you could have, you could authorize other uh, uh, people on maybe a, an option to get people in the same room, but not necessarily geographically. Great, thank you. And with that, I think we are, are at the end of our time. So I'd like to thank all of you for your wonderful presentations and for joining the Q&A. And all the presentations will be um, live on the, available on this platform until Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern, and then they will be added to the MSA Coalition website. And I know we've talked about a few extra handouts, so those will also be available on our website. So again, thank you very much. And I wish everyone um, a good day.